table and they try and at least use it once a <laughs> once an episode so the odd burp's not there and we're, we're live <laughs> good talk to come in on with julia grace hi <laughs> hello people who don't know we were just talking about burping and farting on on podcasts and well, well when you say we um it was well i was, was looking at me and more you but, but I, I was <laughs> looking at you which makes it a consensual <laughs> conversation but i'm just trying to find my volume right under donald trump's hair yeah that's you there that's me is it working yeah it is it is perfect thank you so hi hi welcome to Oti Porti. thank you good to be in town it's so good to be in town you were at Wamaru last night yeah. or not before uh both actually the two um, nights there yeah yeah and what are you doing now? When I used to know you, is that the right way to say it? <laughs> now you're just somebody that I used to know. Well, this was what yeah. you were. You were kind of full-time gigging and singing and stuff, yeah. and your life has taken a bit of a dramatic change to, to being a a wellness and mental health advocate. Yeah. Is that the correct title? Yeah, well, I mean, I just you make up your own title, don't sure. you? Sure. <laughs> and that was one that I thought maybe summed up what I was doing. What does it mean? What is it, what's it all about? I... Throughout all of all of the above, mm. so during, um, be, I mean, I'm, I'm still an artist, I'm still a singer and a songwriter, but as I've gone through that, I've just always told the story that is in my world at the time. So whatever I'm dealing with at the moment, mm. you know, when you get on, you know, get a microphone in front of your face, Pat, you mm. tend to get the truth theorem and you like to tell the story. And um, I've always loved to tell stories and I've always loved to share just what's going on. And so dealing with the stuff that I've dealt with in the past few years has taken a dramatic turn and I've just talked about it basically so So, your own personal stuff yeah yeah yeah. so it started off being my personal sort of journey I was asked um, to play at a big festival and they said do you want to speak into a workshop and I said I'd love to because I'm I'm a teacher and I've always had something Mm -hmm. to say (laughs) always had way too much to say and so they said well you can just sort of talk about whatever you like and so I said well I'm going to talk about coping with crisis because that's what's happening because at the moment I'm coping with crisis so I did a workshop and it was very well received and then in the interceding year up until the next one I found myself dealing with depression and anxiety and clinical and more in a clinical way Mm -hmm. and so they said do you want to do another workshop so I was like absolutely so I said well last year I did coping with crisis so this year I'll do dealing with depression so it was sort of a little bit down the alphabet down the rabbit hole right so then I thought you know next following year I could do like embracing euthanasia and then funding right. your own funeral and just sort of slowly nice. take a downward slide but I never made it to the next one thank goodness but Make, making <laughs> ma- yeah, I don't know. G what's G yeah I don't know um anyway getting good again getting good again yeah that's cool so I did a workshop on depression and to my surprise um I had a couple of psychologists and a doctor come to the workshop like wow. I didn't know beforehand yeah because I was and I gave my point of view from my own experience and some research I had done and I really put the knowledge into story form you know song form humor form as I do and they loved it and they came back the feedback to that was your point of view is valid what you're saying makes a lot of sense and people were like I get it like I've heard it talked about but actually because of the the story form mm. I get it so that for me was after I sort of picked myself up off the floor of having psychologists and doctor listen to me <laughs> I was, oh, shivers. this could have gone awfully bad when you know when you know uh, you didn't know this I but didn't when know. you when you know that you're not the smartest person like when you are like I've had occasions <laughs> speaking to people where I realize I'm the dumbest person in the room <laughs> yeah. why am I speaking to you, <laughs> yeah. you know, why am I up the front here when you guys yeah. are all exponentially more qualified yeah. to be here it I can be intimidating the, I remember being at a Coldplay concert and it was the same week because the Who were in town and uh, Roger Daltrey was at the concert oh, <laughs> yeah. and Chris Martin started playing one of his songs on the piano his intro yeah. and songs and he gets about maybe eight bars into the intro and he's just like I'm sorry I have to start again I've completely fucked this up <laughs> I was just I just had to remember I just remembered that Roger, Roger Daltrey's in the audience and I, I'm sorry I just had to start again and oh so I was goodness. like yeah forgivable, yeah, forgivable. That's a, that's pressure a, is that, on that's a very big example about the, as close the Kiwi version of that is I was mates with the guys in a band who played a Super Groove song yes. while the drummer to Super Groove was in the audience. It's a little, a few steps down though from Roger Daltrey, I think. Oh, I think it's world famous in New Zealand though. That, that is that's world got, famous. Let's bring it, bringing it back. So you're, yeah. you're, you've got these um, learned people coming mm. to you going, Kapai. Yeah. Then what? So from there, I, I did that again, and the second time I, so it was a, a two part event. So the second time I did it, and one was in the south, one was in the north. And I spoke to a bunch of um, teens about this, and, and it talks about 
what does depression sort of what what's happening in your brain you know in a very simplified form and, and some of the thing that, that's going on and a little girl came up to me afterwards and she says my dad um, died by suicide a few years ago wow. and she said I have never understood what was going on in his brain and for the first time when you gave your stories I began to see that no matter what I did it wouldn't have changed the outcome and when, when you say little that, girl, more little girl, oh, little, little compared to me, maybe fifteen. Okay, yeah, she'd maybe been eleven or twelve during the time. Wow, and she had always thought if I'd been a better girl, if mm. I'd been a better daughter, if I tried harder at school, you know, if I had done something, um, then that may have affected the outcome. And when the just the the, the way that I put it, just. It, it made sense to her and so she said I feel um, freed her from something obviously yeah and she yeah. said I realise now that there was nothing I could have done differently yeah. and in fact this is what was happening in his brain and I feel really and I was just like wow okay yeah. I'm done if all I did was that for that kid then my job here is finished <laughs> and I spoke to her mum and she was really encouraging too and so just little feedback little stories um, made me think wow I've actually this is this is worth pursuing mm. and something about the song the stories the humor and then the the role of the teacher where you take the the big complicated scientific issues and turn them into something bite size mm -hmm. that's that's what i'm good at sounds like as well um the personal experience or the personal yeah. story I, I as you're sitting here talking i'm thinking we had emily writes in a few weekends ago the yeah parent and her writing and her um, quote-unquote expertise mm. on parenting seems to be a lot of personal experience yeah. and like the raw shit that goes on yeah. in the house yeah. um which is why i think she's so popular and received so well because yeah. everyone can see their story yeah. and what she's saying it sounds like it's a similar sort of thing yeah. and i think what interestingly you know as time's gone by we've I've, I've sat down with a lot of people and said you know am i should i be bothered like am i doing something useful am i just mm. repeating the same story over and over again and one of the, a lot of the feedback is often, um, you know, it's authentic, it's real, it's coming from the coal face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm I'm here today with my husband Michael. We both deal with mental wellness issues on a, on the daily, and so I like to say some days I wake up and depression is really big in my world. Mm -hmm. Some days I wake up and it's really small in my world. Just like if you've got backache, you know, some days you wake up and your back really hurts. Yep. Some days you wake up and it's it's barely noticeable and that but we deal with it all the time and we do we're right in the middle of it and in the heart of it and it's not something that just gets like fixed or go away it's just mm -hmm. something that you manage really positively like any other health issue i think um it's in i'm interested because to, to see as what you're doing with your other time as well because mm. you seem really busy i looked at your <laughs> uh, your website yeah um with the events on it and the facebook page and it seems that you've got something on every weekend yeah are you still also teaching full time? Are you musicking full time? And <laughs> well, so, what? How do you? Yeah. What happens Monday to Friday? Um, we go home and pay the bills by working. Yeah. yeah. So the music is a part of the communication. So when I speak on mental health, I will speak. I will sing. I will storytell. I will. I will do it all as one. So I don't mm. really see those two as separate. Um, but our reality is, is financially, and our biggest number one mental health pressure point, ironically, is actually just paying the bills. So yeah, we do come back and I book up relieving, Michael's a builder, and we work um, during that time to do all the other stuff. But our biggest refresher is actually this. Is, is talking about mental health as being by out there by refresher do you mean refreshes you yeah right absolutely so you doing you giving out you putting out yeah helps you yeah oh, build very you much up. so very much so and sharing to a big group sharing to one person same same yeah. you know it's like uh it just doesn't matter you're just helping you're caring i think there's i don't know there's something in in both of us that get a lot out of other people's um, you know, finding healing or hope from our story. So this is the great bit. Mm. <laughs> Going home and relieving um, is not the great bit. But that's the reality bit, and that's, those are the pressure points. So when you travel, uh, like, from Auckland to Wamadu, yep. um, is that you're being paid, you're working for someone to bring you in, or does someone say, we want you to come and see us? And so they – so in other words, I'm not I'm – not, Wanted to get into your personal finances, no, but feel free. <laughs> uh, but like you know, I, yeah. I've seen you on TV talking yeah. and, and and sharing that sort of thing. Yeah. But you're not employed by not a group all. to do that. This is we're just not. your own passion, your yeah. own 
uh, and, and people invite you and then they pay for you to come and talk. That's sort of how it works. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, we're self-employed. Um, and so one of the pressure points with that is that, so for example, Uamuru, they organised a couple of events, they invited us down, they cover the, you know, the cost to get us and accommodate us and, and then have paid for that, which is fantastic and we really appreciate that. Um, but all the background stuff, all the time, all the, the radio, TV, all, none of that is paid. Mm. And so one of the things that I find is that people will come and do things and the person before was with xyz organization or they're from the parenting place or they're from world vision or whatever they're all on someone else's dollar yeah, yeah. um and and that's great yeah but um <laughs> we're not uh yeah so we actually have set up a trust to to fund to begin to fund some of that work um but obviously setting up a trust doesn't mean it's got any money yeah, so yeah. it's a process of actually getting some sponsorship basically sponsorship into the trust so that we can cover the costs of the other time and also subsidise places that we would love to go to who can't afford even right. even to do the airfares, you know, sort of thing. So we would just say yes to everybody if possible. Um, so you'd like to, I mean, if, if, if someone yeah. waved the magic wand oh. and you could do this full time, that'd be the dream? 1,000%. Wow. That would be absolutely our dream. And the, the results that we're getting from... And, I mean, I'm happy to speak to anyone. If it's a church organisation, I'll come. But if it's a community organisation, it's just not a problem. Mm. We would come. And, I mean, our dream would be that the trust was funded so that it can just all go there and we just get a normal salary, just like everybody else, mm -hmm. and we just do a normal work like everybody else and we would just go anywhere and everywhere. Um, and part of that is because we love it, but a big part of it is actually because it's working. And the feedback we're getting from people is just overwhelmingly positive so that's cool um i was going to say we don't have a check for you to pay you for doing this but a nice a nice uh, lake hayes <laughs> pinot gris i've already started hopefully that. that'll do for a bit of payment from today thank you <laughs> um you say it's working what how what's the metric i mean i mm. understand anecdotal mm. anecdotal <laughs> conversations mm. so by saying it's working i'm thinking well that's measurable how, Pretty, how do you yeah. know well there's a good question um probably from anecdotal conversations okay. at this stage and maybe we need to put a bit of a more rigorous uh, research around that but just consistently people coming coming back to us and saying you know I'm not hearing about this stuff because I'm, I'm very honest to ask people um, what do you think mm -hmm. and also what's the point because for us it is a level of personal sacrifice and I've sat down with you know highly qualified counsellors psychologists and and people who are working in a more maybe scientific background mm -hmm. and said you know is Am, am I bothered? <laughs> am, am I, I bothered? bothered? <laughs> like, uh, should I be bothering over here? Yeah. Or do you see me as just, you know, the icing on the cake sort of thing? And the, the feedback has, has consistently been you have a, a different point of view and you're getting it across in a different way. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's supporting all of the... I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of research. Um, I've just been studying through Yale, doing some work on psychology, neuroscience. I'm fascinated by the brain and how it works. But all of that stuff has to come down to, like, now what? Mm. What do I do? What do you do? You know, like, that's not... It's not really building in. Um, and it's actually saying, well, how do I get that information so that people can really use it in their everyday life? Yeah. Yeah. So probably I'd, I'd agree with you. Maybe it's anecdotal and I need to do a bit more oh, research. Not agreeing with me. I was but just wondering what that meant. That's all. Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a hypothesis. No, it was a question. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So what's your, you, you kind of talked about um, going to community groups, going to yeah. you know church groups you mentioned. What's your typical audience? Like if you were going to say, we've got six of these coming up, mm. you know, four of them are going to be what? Are they normally community groups? Are they, are they, who's your normal customer for want of a less yeah. wanky word? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, who's the clientele? Yeah, there you yeah go. it's kind of getting to a point where a weekend will be um, often a church will sponsor the, the weekend because they just, I mean, churches just happen to be groups of people that are quite, organized into meeting regularly so yep. that's what makes them useful and probably handy. not not that i think i don't know this but not the churches mm. have a lot of money but certainly mm. the money they have probably put put towards this kind of thing for the community would be a, a normal 
yes. connection, like a natural thing to do. Yeah, and it's yeah. considered to be um, good value for a church to be doing a community event. Yeah. 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 Um, and so often what will happen was the church will sponsor the weekends and so we'll do Sunday. So that gets them a Sunday service, All right. which everybody <laughs> loves, which is cool. And then also they will run a community event either before or after that. So next weekend we're in um, Nelson and so we've got a couple of different churches there and we're doing that. So I think one, we're doing a ladies event on Friday night. So we're talking to women about mental health. Mm-hmm. And then Sunday we do Sunday morning. The other church we're doing a Sunday with the church and a Monday night community event. So that's becoming quite normal. So you're in Dunedin today. Yeah. You're in Nelson when? Uh, next weekend. So um, I arrive Mach- Friday, Mach- Saturday. Mach- will arrive Saturday. So you go back to Auckland, then yep. back down. So yeah. if this was your full time gig, yeah. and you had those two appointments, you'd go ah. So what can we do between Dunedin and exactly. Mott? And just drive up and do yeah. it on the way, sort of thing. Yeah, hundred percent. And we'd be able to then go okay, who who between here and there has got no money? Yeah, you know. And and I mean, on a really practical note, if we're going into a church or an organisation that has some money, then they need to pay. You know, yeah. like it, it's, this is not something where we'll go oh, everyone else has to pay for everything. If they can fund that, then great, that's brilliant. But we'd love to then be able to go, okay, midweek, who would love to have us, can't even start, or could only pay a little bit, we'll come. Or, or we'll put us up for three nights. Or, yeah, just just yeah. have us there. And then, then that is salary, just like everyone else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's been so long since I've had a normal salary job, I've forgotten. Um, we were speaking in a um, in a church in Auckland, and Mary Grant, who's actually on our board of trustees, All right. came up to me afterwards, and she's like, oh, I just love what you do, it's so great. She goes, now, who pays your salary? And I was like, my what? <laughs> 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 and I actually, I, I, I cried in the conversation because she was saying something, what, what, how do you do that? And we're just like, well, we just do. Make it we work. We just do, yeah. Um, but I was very adamant starting out on this journey a couple of years ago, that you do the mahi and then you get the treats. Right. And I know if that's a terribly Kiwi thing to, you know, <laughs> terrible Kiwi. But I was like, I'm not going to ask for help until I can say, by the way, if you don't help me, I'm going to do it anyway. And this is, uh, uh, we, we do this, we will put our money where the mouth is. Mm. Um, and we will continue to do it. Rather than like, oh, guys, I've got a great idea. Can you pay for it? Does something inside of my Kiwi proudness says, nah. I'm not going to do that. So it's a build it and they will come? Yeah. Get it up and off the ground and get it running? Yeah. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, yeah. James? <laughs> Does that? <laughs> it sounds vaguely familiar. <laughs> Number eight, why done is done is, eh? <laughs> yeah, and that's how, that, that's how I think. You think that's Kiwi thing? Uh, just rip into it and see what. Yeah, uh, just give it a go, bro, you know? See if it's, uh, see. I, I remember working with a, I remember working with a group. I was probably 20, 22 group of young people together we'd get together and we decided to put on a, a monthly event uh, it was in a, in a church group yeah. and we did all sorts of stuff got it ready put a put a band together um you know had a gig had fun it was going to be a monthly event yeah. uh, built a stage out of trestle tables oh, and had um books from under the building that we then gaffer taped together and they were the risers for the trestle table <laughs> gaffer taped the whole thing together and just did it yeah and did it for three or four months and then finally the people who kind of ran the building and stuff came to us and said look whilst maybe you didn't go about this the right way to start it yeah. we just think that what you're doing is great and we want to support it so what can we do so it was that awesome. kind of build it and then yeah then, and then we didn't yeah. even ask for them to be involved we just said we're using your four walls mm. and we're going to do it mm. so I, I get it I'm, I'm mm. interested at the idea that that's a Kiwi thing I mm. don't know maybe I'm just assuming it's a Kiwi thing because I'm a Kiwi it sort of feels just a little bit like you your good idea is not quite valid until you've done it right and you've shown that it actually well, works in, in business it's a soft launch isn't it it's a it's a it's a proof of concept if it's a business thing. It's very thing. entrepreneurial. Yeah. yeah, just just getting it out there. And I know Michael's very entrepreneurial. And when when we first met, he's, he was like, why isn't somebody, why isn't an organisation sort of snapped you up to, you know, to do that? But I don't know, it's just that thing of going, you just do, you just do stuff. I've been involved with organisations in the past that hasn't necessarily always ended well. And um, I think that, <laughs> um, I think that sometimes you just, do what is important. I feel like this is my life's work. And I guess if you if you are the quote unquote organization, yeah, then you're not involved in, but you are it. Yeah, then you have complete control as well. You <laughs> decide yeah. what you're not you're not beholden to some 
weird Hitlerish dictator at the top that wants things done a certain way and yep. it falls over. Yeah, and no so. one tells you what colour your hair should be. Yeah. Um, exactly. I've, I've got a story. I've got a few, got a few of those as well. <laughs> yeah, but you probably yeah. know some of my yeah, stories. Yeah, you probably know some of mine. <laughs> yeah, and so it's actually going, I think there's something about being independent. But what happened actually earlier this year, we sat down with some amazing friends of ours who've become really pivotal in our world and they basically challenged us and they're like, ah, you're not practising what you preach. So you get up here and say... You know, ask for help, be open to community, and then you're not letting anybody know what's going on right. behind the scenes. Right. And we sat with them and we were talking about out of our finances and it was just dire, you know. And um, and we don't live a high, we live a very low life, you know, not low life, but um, we live a very simple life and would live simpler if we could. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but it was still having this huge pressure. And so you've got this weird thing where everyone's like, oh, that's so great, but... I had a funny situation. I was in a, um, I won't say where it was, but it starts with F and ends with Onganui. Um, <clears throat> and a lady came up to All me close. at an event <laughs> and she uh, was very lovely and says, you know, we love what you do. It's amazing. You know, I've changed my life, blah, blah, blah. Um, we would love to support you. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, chime the bells. Like, I can't even <laughs> believe it. This is amazing. She would love to support you. We are going to pray that someone gives you money. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, slap me now. It's just, yeah. And that sort of was a crystallization of that that attitude of, you know, we we just wish somebody else would. What you're doing is so great, we hope someone else pays for it. Yeah. Do you think that in this day and age, it's actually the, I'm thinking about things like Pathos and that sort of thing. Yeah. The way things are set up, it's actually the easiest time to get sort of support. Hmm. I, when I say the easiest time, I mean, the structures are in place to make it easier than ever yeah, we're to getting there. get support for yeah. a not-for-profit or for mm. a, a, a non-commercial entity because things like Pathos, you, you just it's already there. You go sign yeah. up, get send people to it, they give you money, yeah, so to yeah. speak. And we have some amazing sponsors, and we so appreciate it. We've got some personal sponsors. Um, a couple of churches have said, hey, we're paying missionaries to go and do stuff in foreign lands. Um, maybe we could you know, send a little bit of that your way. And so we've appreciated that. So it has begun, which is a slight pressure point off, but it's, um, you know, it's a small, it's a small beginning. And it's been really encouraging that there is a small beginning at all. <laughs> it's, also, cool. it's also that thing, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, having walked the not-for-profits and charitable yeah. organisations a lot in my life, yeah. that at some point, though, if you're not actually able to live, yeah. there is a, a kind of, it's that fish will cut bait. You know, the fish will cut bait. Do you keep going with the fishing? Yeah. Or do you realise it's too big to wheel in so you, you cut bait and, yeah. and let it go sort of thing? Yeah. Not suggesting that for you or you yeah. guys. Really, I just say at during life, that at some point that becomes a reality. Yeah. Now, whether yeah. that's in, in 30 years' time when someone needs to retire or <laughs> yeah. whether that's, you know, all our savings are gone and we have a mortgage to pay or whatever, there yeah. comes that point in time. And I don't know, it, 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 it'd be great. I mean, what to get your website out there so people know what you're mm. doing and people can follow your story. Your website's yeah. just... So juliegrace.co.nz. Oh, that's easy, yeah, isn't it? Nice and we easy. bring that up, Jason, put it up in the background. <laughs> there there we go. Here she is. There we go. I look, so I look like I'm levitating, apparently, in this photo. So where is that? Where is that photo? That that's was a, at... Um, a cool building. That was at Festival One. Right, uh, so that's in Hamilton. Little, yep, in Mystery Creek in that area, and there's me... Telling a story about depression and everybody's laughing. And it pretty much sums up. <laughs> they're pretty happy with your depression story, those they people. They do. I've had people say to me, they go, oh, you're talking about mental health. I thought it was going to be way more serious, but I'm really glad it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's that kind of thing. Well, as a communicator as well, obviously, there's a way to wrap a, a story and tell it to make it, you know, yeah. acceptable and receivable. Well, the story, actually, in doing the psychology behind it, the story and the humour are the best ways to learn. And yeah. I didn't know that until I did some research on it because I just do this, you know, you just do your thing. Yeah. I mean, you're like me. You just, you just be you. You just be Pat. And, and that that works. And then sometimes you look sometimes. back and go, <laughs> it's working. <laughs> and sometimes you look back and go, why did that work? And then you do a bit of research and you realise that that worked for a good scientific reason or for a good, you know, theoretical reason. I was asked to do an event where I was speaking to speakers about using humour. Yep. And I was like, well, I don't know, I just do. I just, I didn't even think I was funny. I just make a few jokes and whatever. And so when I did some research into it, I found why the humour makes the message easier. I have, to I have, a, theory, I have a theory on this. Tell me, tell yep. me, tell me why, and I'll see if, if our theories line up. Okay. 
Oh, there you go. You tell me yours first. Oh, my theory. No, yeah. no, no, you tell me well, your theory. theory. Well, the theory is, and I've heard many kind of, mm. um, it's it's based, my theory is not based on this, but this is where I first started hearing it. Mm. People like John Stewart in the States doing The Daily Show, mm. and um, obviously he doesn't do it anymore, but those shows, those comedy shows, last week tonight with John Oliver would be a good example now, yeah. that they're able to sometimes speak to truth more powerfully than, for example, the news networks. And um, asked about that, um, in the John Stewart era, yeah. Al Gore said to him very clearly because it was the only person that was able to tell the truth to the king was the, the jester. Yeah, yeah. And so he was the only one who was able to say exactly the truth yeah. without having his head cut off. Yeah. And I think that's a very clear tradition of, you know, comedy and comedians being able to, and, and the use yeah. of light, being able to receive a truth in a way with in that day it was get your head cut off but maybe in mm. this day and age it's out as, <laughs> the equivalent my, of getting head as cut my off. old mum used to say without getting the ump and, and kind of walking out the door <laughs> yeah you know yeah. no absolutely and that, that court jester was an amazing thing because they were often the most trusted person and often the most intelligent person in the room but they appeared there's something the, disarming fool, about yeah. appearing to be the fool and I think being able to laugh at yourself I mean I, I, I start with you know ridiculous stories about my my journey and the crazy things we do I mean we so nearly missed the flight on the way here entirely due to my ultimate stupidity and it just I'm, I'm messing things up left right and centre and I think by now that's a very Kiwi thing is being able to admit it. Self deprecation, you know, is very maybe it's a yeah. bit of a British thing too. But I think the humour gives a softness. Yeah. But there's another part to it is actually jokes and humour, um, they create a little problem. They're like everybody doing a little puzzle. And when they get it, they get a little hit of dopamine. Mm. So it's like everybody in the room doing a Rubik's mm. Cube and when they get it, they're yeah. like oh. Yay. And there's the, the the easiest way to recognise that is being the person who doesn't get the joke. And right. everyone else is like, oh, and you're like, ah, and how awful you feel. And then finally when you do solve the puzzle, which is the, the, the element of surprise, the funny thing that happens, the release of tension, the joke in the room, everyone's like, ah. Oh. So they get a little hit of dopamine. And while they're in that drugged up state, <laughs> then you hit them with some truth. Yeah. You know, because that same drug is, is the same as if you win lotto or snort cocaine. Or drink wine. Or drink wine. Boom. <laughs> tick, tick, tick. And then everybody's um, everybody's then open to what, what you say next. That's really interesting. It's actually amazing. Yeah. So the the, the yeah the sense of humour of the comedy opens them up to... It actually does. ...to hear. It's like, ha, <laughs> stab. <laughs> <laughs> but done in a nice way, and I think done in a way that says, I'm, I'm as willing to stab you as I am to stab myself. Yeah, sure. And I think one of my big things, particularly speaking into like faith communities, is to say, look, I'm not here to critique you, criticise you, drag you down, but I'm here to call it. I'm here to call BS across the borders mm. when I can. And I'm not from the outside trying to like, we talk about mental health. I'm not here to go, well, you guys don't do anything about mental health. I'm actually here to go, I didn't know either. Until I actually had my first panic attack, I was like, oh, you people are so dramatic. What is wrong with you? Why yeah. can't you just pull it together? Until I began dealing with depression, I'd be like, man, you guys are making bad life choices. <laughs> What's wrong with you? And I realized later it was uh, most of my, most of the good things in my life were just white privilege. Right. That's yeah. interesting. And I thought, you know, God was blessing me left, right and center, but actually I was just white middle class with a really privileged background. And that made a soft entry into the world is that and, and so therefore when you're talking about mental health issues and depression and that is mm. that like is that an area that you kind of come to that realization and you go oh shit mm. so there's actually kind of i i we've talked about this often on on this podcast and certainly i'm talking about this a lot yeah. in my private life at the moment yeah. about how so many people in life think they've had a home run um not acknowledging they've started on third base <laughs> 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 you know and kind that's of that's a great way of putting it and kind of going through the idea of what have i done to be in the yeah. place i am right now and that's i'm not saying that i'm yeah. in any particular flash place but you know own a house you yeah. know, uh, have great kids, all these yeah. things that I kind of home run on a motorbike. Yeah, well, I mean, I certainly, <laughs> I certainly yeah. haven't started on on home base because even even like I had the ability, I didn't have the ability. I literally had, you know, parents that had the ability hmm. to um, lend me some money for the first house. Yeah. So you know that's nothing to do with me, and acknowledging all those things, we have nothing to do with yeah. us. Yeah. Like that's why I'm always confused with people who are proud of their country. Like I'm so proud to be American. It's yeah. Like you had no. <laughs> 
No, ac- you've done <laughs> no nothing. No thanks to you, mate. But yeah, you've done nothing yeah. to be in that spot. Yeah. Complete chance, complete nothing. It's You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like figuring out a way to, I'm not saying not to be proud of, but to be proud of your achievements yeah. and acknowledge the stuff that you haven't done yeah. or other people have done on your behalf or that you've had no control over yeah. that's helped you to get to that achievement. Yeah, and I think that keeps it real because you realise that without those step-ups and those those leg-ups, you know, you could be just as much the person down the road who you might have looked down on. Totally. And actually to go, man, I don't know where I'd be if I had lived under those circumstances or I had have had those disadvantages. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm which really they, glad which, I didn't. Which they've but, uh, many wow. times don't have any control over either. And yeah. that's the thing. When you acknowledge what you don't have control over that's helped you, yeah. you have to therefore go to that person, as you say, down the road and go, well, what have they had no control over that's put them in that position? And I think that's what builds empathy yeah it does and when you're in that position suddenly you go oh that's like my little tag phrases you know i say my life is like a long series of getting knocked off my high horse and getting back on progressively smaller horses and right now i'm saddling up a chihuahua (laughs) so i'm here just going i'm watching my friends um you know moving on to their third lifestyle block or building their mega church or just doing all these amazing things and i'm so happy for them like Mm. i genuinely am but I'm I'm over here just kind of going. <laughs> Half the time I feel like I'm just treading water to almost catch up. Yeah. Um, and yet there's been something in that journey that has created this, um, you know, this this desire to go. I am now one of the minority group in a way. When I became single, so I became a single mum at forty, in a faith in a church community. Um, which is not my only frame of reference, but one of them. But it was the first time I'd become a minority group. Right. Because I'd always been a walk into church, church, white, middle class, married, beautiful home, family. I was a singer, easy worship leader. You know, like I had roles and and it was a very easy walk in. And all of a sudden I was the single mum. Now, there's nothing wrong with being the single mum, but there's not that many of them right. in that context. And suddenly I was like, oh, wow, I'm hearing what's being said through different ears. Mm. I'm starting to think, different are you talking point. to all of us or yeah. just those people? Because I'm not one of those people anymore. And I think it gave me a little bit of insight maybe into, you know, not other minority groups because I'm not part of them, but what it feels like to be part of a minority group. I think it's really quite I, th- I think it's really important. I remember when I used to work in Talkback, we'd often have a lot of conversations around the thems. Yeah. Like a lot of the Talkback callers would be about the why can't they just be like us or whatever. Yeah. And the point I would always, or, or, or let's bring in legislation to stop X, Y, Z. Um, you know, it was mm. ZB, so one of the typical one was ban the burqa, whatever shit. That's yeah, all, yeah, you know, yeah. anyway. The and I, the thing that I would always say to people is, just remember though, you're a minority. And they'd go, what? And I'd go, well, everyone is, has some element of minor. Do you own a dog? Yes, I've got a dog. You're a minority. Yeah. Minority of, you know, so if we brought in legislation about dogs, it would affect you. Yeah. So like, then, to try oh. and, yeah, yeah, exactly. But that's <laughs> yeah, the yeah. point. They kind of go, flip, I mean, yeah. And I was just thinking about you talking about the high horse that he knocked off and progressing s- smaller horses. And you've mentioned Mary Grant, her husband Ian, yeah. um, has a saying that he always uses, which is, "I'm just a beggar trying to show other beggars where to find bread." Yeah, yeah. You know, that's his yeah. one of his kind of wrote sayings, and it's like yeah. it's a lovely, lovely way of kind of going, "I'm nothing special." Yeah. Um, all of us are nothing special, really, yeah, and yeah. we're just trying to get through this thing called life together. Yeah, and I mean that 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 humility is mm. literally what drew us to them to go, hey, you know, you guys, in in one sense you're amazing, and in the other sense you're just really, really normal. Mm. And so we, you know, we so appreciate their support because they get it um, on that kind of level. But I think my, you know, my mum used to they put it, you know, she'd say there, but for the grace of God go I. But she was brought up in highly dysfunctional background and then chose to bring us up in a highly functional background, um, thank goodness. But she was very quick to remind us <laughs> that we were awfully lucky mm. to be in that highly functional background because that's not where she came from. So she had she had to work hard to achieve a functional background, oh, I would think. Oh, full on, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, married a guy who was um, able to, to do that. And together they were able to do that, and they had, they had good support and they had a strong, strong community, strong faith, strong, you know, something in them was able to move forward as well but no it's really um I guess I've had to look at what were my sub thoughts towards Mm -hmm. mental mental illness and mental health meaning sub thoughts meaning sort of preconceived ideas Yeah, yeah yeah and I mean even this word mental 
Yeah. Like have, unpacking that, you know, we say physical and we all think positive. We're all mm. like, oh, great, physical health. Yeah, yeah, that's good. You, good on you. Say mental health. Like, mm, those mental health, you know. And the term, um, you know, crazy, mental, psycho, uh, and all these sort of terminologies and actually going, we can't, we, we now we know better, we've got to do better. Mm-hmm. And I think we've improved in physical disability, you know, the way people are treated, the way people are spoken about. Um, and I look back and how we used to speak towards people who had physical disability and I just cringe at what was okay to be saying in the 70s, you know, with people who might have disabilities. Mm-hmm. But then to put that further and to go mental health issues, um, you know, and to say we're all on a spectrum. We're all on a mental wellness spectrum, and it changes over the course of a lifetime. Might change over the course of twenty four hours. Well, it's, it's. I've had this conversation with someone in the last few weeks. You know, yeah. if you've if you got a bacterial infection, <laughs> yeah. you take antibiotics for it. No yeah. one questions it. If you've got a broken leg, you put it in a cast. And no one questions it. Yeah. If you've got depression, why should that be any different from a societally accepting the medical intervention side of that? Exactly. I, I don't. There shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't, but it's taking some time. Well, I mean, I've, I've kind of gone through my own experiences as well since, mm. um, you know, marriage breakup and some pretty heavy um, things to work through and figure out from there. Yeah. And, yeah, it's it's that kind of – it is it is there but for the grace of God, but it's also seeing it from the other – it's it's all very well to have all the theories in the world. Yep. Oh, you know, it's all the same, but <laughs> until, you, until you go through it yeah. – uh, on some level, yeah. um, you don't understand. Yeah, and every time you, so I'm constantly looking for the gold, the, the next golden calf to, to give it a smash. And mm-hmm. so the picture of that is, you know, wh- what's people's boundary and how can I kind of do that? So first of all, we'll come into a situation and say, look, um, so when, when we speak on mental health, I'll use, I use Julia Grace and the F word. So I've got all these Fs. So we've got whānau, fullness, faith, fun, fitness, food, and pharmaceuticals. And yes, I know it's a pH. but um, And, you know, addressing this, and you can feel in the room the people who are like, oh, I don't know if you want to be taking drugs. Mm. You know, and so I, I'll, I'll hit up against that barrier until I feel it break down. But then the next barrier is... Oh, but you don't want to be on them forever. Mm. And I'm like, well, why not? Mm. Who said? Who said? If you had epilepsy, you'd probably be on drugs for the rest Dude, of your life. If you had, ins- you're taking insulin. You yeah. don't stop taking. So I'm not saying you have to, but I'm questioning why would you not? Mm. You know, like why is that? And what's not the okay? attitude around? Why? Yeah, would you and, not? and what do you mean by that? You know, and then also a friend of mine, she's um, said now we're getting to a point where mental mental health. I'm putting that in inverted commas for the camera. Mental health <laughs> issues. Um, are accepted, but then some are sexier than others. Like what? Like it's okay to be depressed and anxious, but if you come to work and you're bipolar, yep. suddenly the the boss is like, oh, bit tough that one, you know, because she might, that, how's that going to affect me? And so a little bit kind of thinking, you know, what, which parts of this is okay? And, and the reality is some mental illnesses are harder to deal with than others, no question. You know, if you're having... Um, psychotic breaks and stuff that's going to affect your life more than if you have mild depression Mm -hmm. but if you are going to say to someone in a wheelchair you know you can't come in because I'm not going to make access for you Mm -hmm. not okay yeah you have to you know and you and someone said to me oh we don't want uncle (laughs) someone's saying about a family thing oh we've decided not to let Uncle so and so come to family Christmas because he's just he's just a pain in the neck you know Mm. and in the end I sort of stopped and I said I'm just going to stop you there. If he was in a wheelchair, could he come? Oh, of course. And I said, I, I understand what you're saying because he's an absolute pain in the neck. <laughs> I understand. I said, but I feel uncomfortable with this feeling that he's too much kind of his family. Yeah. And you kind of got to – and you might have to put some boundaries around how long he's there for and, you know, maybe, maybe give him a couple of whiskeys on the way and just calm him <laughs> down. Or, you know, you may have to manage that. But I felt uncomfortable that somehow his mental health was going to stop him being part of the community. And, hey, that's harder to do than, you know, talk about practice what you preach. It's, yeah. It can be hard to do. Is there a, um, not to, I, I, I don't do that kind of devil's advocate, you know, conversations. I yeah. think it's pointless. No, it. um, but I'm also wondering, you know, from the boss, from the household, from the, mm. from the family sort of thing, you know, uh, I guess I'm kind of thinking when's it okay to exclude which doesn't feel right saying that out loud 
um but you talked about boundaries etc i i sort of i sort of think so the example you've just given about uncle yeah. um if you're excluding him just because of the mental health issue that seems mm. wrong if he gets excluded because there is a boundary that can't be crossed to keep you safe how do you marry yeah. those two things up yeah yeah it's complicated um and i think actually being there's a part of going you know you are valuable mm -hmm. but so am i and so are my kids i'm a bit of a um yeah so once again it's such a complicated mm -hmm. issue i feel personally that children's safety is paramount because they are they're our care you know yeah. they're in our care so somebody um if, if they are unsafe emotionally or whatever then I'd, i would have to in the same way i think you know it's every parent's you're allowed to be a bit of a snob when it comes to caring for your kids because that's your ultimate responsibility. Mm. And if you're not going to protect them, well, who is? So I think if there's an unsafe issue like that, then that's sort of a bottom line. I, I'm not even talking necessarily. I mean, it sounds like yeah. when you talk about kids and unsafe, you think straight away physically sort of thing. Oh, yeah. I'm not even necessarily talking about that. But I, I mean, I know there's people in my life at the moment that I keep distance from yeah. for my own protection, oh, yeah, for yeah. my own mental yeah. health, well-being, for that sort of thing. Yeah. There's a boundary there. <laughs> How do we figure out, you know, yeah. excluding uncle because he's too hard versus excluding uncle because actually it's what I need to, when I say be safe, I mean yeah. sort of emotionally as well, yeah. mentally. So how does your mental health, um, when, when is yours more important than theirs? Yeah, or, like or you, being able to, it, it, yeah. There's always going to be times where there's a decision where yeah. you might have to put yourself first or yeah. uh, someone might have to um, receive a detrimental decision, be it exclusion from the Christmas yeah, because yeah. It, it, and I'm not talking flippant, like it just doesn't work for me, he's too hard. I mean yeah. like, you know, I can think of people as I talk to you th who I have sort of excluded from my life because yeah. Yeah. it's just not a, so it's I. not a safe relationship for me to have yeah. for my sake. Yeah. So they're not coming to Christmas, no yeah. matter what, no matter <laughs> even if they were uncle, which which yeah. they're not. Yeah, yeah. I think we're um, we're talking to someone actually a couple of weeks ago and talking about um, having to maybe exclude a child, an adult child, from a situation because she was coming and her behaviour was just toxic. Yeah. So she was turning up to things and just causing ripples and issues with everybody. And I think there's at some level got to be able to say, yes, that person's important and yes, we do want to try and include them if possible. Um, but the boundaries say when their right to express themselves is now infringing on our sanity or mm. our enjoyment or our our family, I think then you've got to be able to go, look, I'm going to uh, rate my mental health important too yeah so i mean gosh there's no good answer to that because no. then who's going to have them but if you are sacrificing yourself on the altar of everyone else's goodwill <laughs> yeah. then then we lose you and that's not fair so part of that it's, in, it's an interesting way to look at it because as you say that i think every mother in the universe <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean it's like yeah, so yeah. often mums yeah. put themselves last yeah and everyone else's enjoyment and pleasure comes first yeah. and it is a mum trait it is um and i sometimes think yeah, it gets a little bit uncomfortable because I'm, I'm like, you don't want to exclude people, you don't want to yeah. um, make people be isolated because that's even worse for them. Mm. But equally, maybe not equally, but also, um, it just makes me think there's so many because you've been to Christmas, so many Christmases <laughs> that people come away going, oh, thank goodness I've got that over for the year, <laughs> yeah. like not because of what's happened in yeah, the, in, amongst yeah. the family and stuff. They yeah. people want to get rid of it. Yeah, like oh, good God, I'm glad that's gone. We have to <laughs> yeah. worry about that for another twelve months. Yeah, and I think actually just getting real and saying, do you want to keep doing that to yourself? Mm. What's your life like going forward? And I know of people who've had to make really hard calls with really close people. Yeah, and say, you know what, I could build a bridge here. Yeah. not maybe so much about mental health but just more about that emotional health which is mild you know i mean they're all related yeah um and say yeah it's going to be better for us all around me and as for me and my house we ain't coming yeah um, <laughs> you I, know and i think that's okay i that, think christmas is a good one to talk about because yeah. obviously there's already stresses with christmas and yeah. financial stresses with christmas and yeah. i remember one of the best christmases we ever had i, I was married at the time but yeah. um was uh in dunedin Fairly recently moved to the need. Might have only been here 13 months. Um, didn't really know anyone. Our closest friends that we spent the last Christmas with in the were gone. Mm. And there was uh, two parents and three kids yeah. and no one else all day. I mean, there was phone calls and there was Skype to family in yeah. other parts of the country and world. But it was... Um, 
we have lunch at one o'clock. All of a sudden it was two o'clock, then it was three o'clock, then it was four. And now we're having lunch at six o'clock at night. Yeah. But we just hung out all day, yeah. played PlayStation, watched movies. And it was like one of the best, best Christmases ever. <laughs> it was it's amazing. So cool. yeah. And I think now sometimes about Christmas in particular, and I guess I'm diverting a bit from the, cool. the straight mental health conversation, but, you know, being in New York with a couple of people and experience an actual winter Christmas sort of thing oh, without yeah. all the family around yeah. might be actually quite freeing as well. Yeah, and I know people who decide every now and then to go, oh my goodness, I'm actually going to do our Christmas overseas like that, you know, or go and get a white Christmas or yeah. or go away. And, you know, and there's that thing of like, oh my gosh, I don't, A, I don't want to miss out and B, um, you know, I don't want to sort of let, let the team down. Um, but, hey, you could you could have the best the best time I mean I have an amazing family and we always do Christmas all together and it's it's never been it's never had this issue yeah so I'm really grateful for that but I can totally understand um having to put up I've had to put up big boundaries around people and just sort of say you know you're not if I'm going to tell everyone else to care for their mental health yeah and then I'm not going to care for mine well I might as well just stop now you know so I actually need to go um, and I think when, when you've dealt with pressure and stress in your life, you're never quite the same. You know, it's like having a, an old sports injury. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have, you have uh, vulnerabilities in that area. And I know for me, um, I've had to learn to go, you know, that, that's enough noise. It's enough people. Um, I need to just kind of introvert a little bit here, escape, go, go away. My dad used to do it when we were young. We'd go to family picnics and he'd go off and do the cryptic crossword. <laughs> Right, <laughs> you'd find him in the car doing the crypto crossword. He'd be like, "Dad, what is wrong with you?" You know, and I, I just thought he was, "What's wrong?" He's, you know, he's so rude. And and I look back now and I think, "Oh, he's in the best place. <laughs> he's in the car, yeah, nice and warm, happy, doing the crypto crossword. Everyone's around. Everyone's fine. And now he can like escape and do his thing. And I actually think, <laughs> I think I'm more like him than I than I thought. <laughs> and then you can regroup, come back, go away, <laughs> come back." <laughs> You know, do your thing. Is Christmas coming back to kind of yeah. what your passion is and what you're doing with speaking to people about, you know, health, um, mental wellness, etc. Christmas, I would believe, would be a particularly stressful time of year for mental health issues to come up. Yeah, it's a shocker. What do we What do we experience across Christmas that might be different from the rest of the year? W- why is it so stressful? Yeah, I yeah. mean, I mean, uh, uh, like I, like I was saying, it's sort of. Um, it makes me think about being, um, I guess what I was just thinking as you were talking was I what I've been through in the last three or four years, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't been able to give out, Yeah. right? I, I haven't had the fortitude, I haven't had the energy, I haven't had the mental health space, head space yeah. to give out. Yeah. So I've, I've shut people away yeah. because there are people who cause me to be worse rather than better. Yeah. And um, I think all of us in all stages of our life, we're either in a place where we can give, yeah. where we can't give, or maybe we're in between. Yeah. And it's those times that we can't give that makes me think if that's a Christmas thing and yeah. the exclusion thing again, that that is... Um, I meet people who say a similar thing to what I've just said, but then they feel guilty about it. Yeah, they're like, and they're the people who always want to give and always want to help. Yeah, but I, I know for me, I, I haven't had the the um, reserves. Yeah, to give out for the last few years. Yeah, so the people who I've surrounded myself with of recently are people who I have either got from or we have been sort of on a neutral, not needing anything from the other person. Yeah. The concern with that is, I think at times. Um, we do need to give mm. and at times there are people around us who we do need to help mm. um, it's a long winded way of talking about Christmas isn't it mm. probably maybe it's not about Christmas uh, yeah. it's about the the evolution of when we can give when we can't give yeah. I mean I think that would be heightened at Christmas time because everyone wants to give yeah and just thinking about over Christmas, what kind of things do come up and yeah. how we deal with them. Yeah, and I think we're required, or well, we feel that we're required to give maybe financially, to give in different ways. But I'm, I'm just thinking of you, I'm thinking of your, you know, of your girls and demonstrating mm-hmm. to them positive, uh, positive, honest. I, I've, I've always been pretty honest with my kids about this stuff. Mm. And to say, you know what, I'd love to maybe do more with more people, but I'm going to be really honest with you. I, I don't have it in me at the moment but a way of doing that might be to say hey I, I'm not kind of up to you know cheer cheer rah rah 
but maybe we could go to Kmart and give to the giving tree or mm. you know we could find another way to give that's not going to take a lot of emotional energy and and demonstrate to them that um, that everything you do doesn't have to require that talking face to face um because it can be draining can be really really full on yeah. and i know both michael and i are quite we're um outgoing introverts so we will be very outgoing yep. and love all this and love 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 and then but then we'll recharge um so it's very refreshing to do all that but then the real the real recharge battery recharge we come home we're like okay see you later babe Mwah. and then we'll go to separate rooms right. you know and and we'll read watch tv just literally be able to do what i want to do and part of that's being an adult who's been single for a while where you get used to your own little things but part yeah. of it's just growing up and saying what if i wasn't here what would you be doing you know and if, if what you would be doing was a solitary just chill out time then don't don't let me don't let me stop you and so sometimes giving doesn't have to be uh, social or emotional mm -hmm. it could literally just be doing something that is you know seasonal um that doesn't require all that and i think that's showing your kids that there's more than one you know more than one neurotype more than one uh, emotional type some of us aren't up for you know going down and at, to the soup kitchen because it would just be overwhelming yeah. just too much oh i can't, can't even imagine but i wouldn't mind maybe giving a, a donation to someone else who, who might be good at doing that yeah. stuff or so. donation to the soup kitchen and then that's yeah the, exactly for that's someone else thing. who's got who's good at the gift of the gab who can chat all day with them and got the emotion i love what you said about the reserves someone who knows they've got the emotional reserve but if you know that your emotional reserves are low and you've only got a little bit then who needs those you i always and think your kids. i always <laughs> think about my reserves being like a water tank yeah my water tank also has an overflow tank yeah and i know where my water tank is empty hmm. right but i i know the difference as well when the reserve tank is empty yeah right. and i know when i'm in a particular state and normally it's exhaustion, yeah. tired, yeah. where I need time to even fill the reserve tank before yeah. I can even get back to the water tank. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I and yeah. I and I talk to my kids like that. I talk to them about the the, the, the energy and the tank yeah. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's I think self awareness is really important. Yeah. And I think what I've learned in the last I've been on a bit of a journey for the last sort of seven or eight years, let alone the last three or four kind of post marriage yeah. years, is is that self awareness and to be able to know where I am because you know, it's that old saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Yeah. Well, when you're a solo dad. Dad ain't happy. If, yeah. yeah, it's so the same how do sort you of thing. Fill, how do you fill that reserve tank, let alone the other one? What, what do you do to... A lot of the time it's rest. Yeah. Um, a lot of the time it's uh, space. It's amazing. I'm an, I'm an extrovert uh, out there as well. You know, like <laughs> I get energy from people. Yeah. But I wonder if I've moved a bit in my way I, I work because I know that... If I get to that point, I go. I need my space. Nobody, yeah. nobody come near me. I need my space. Yeah. And I'm always very careful to make sure the girls who I have half the time yeah. know what's going on. Yes. Um, but they know as well sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a couple of occasions. I think I put it on my Instagram feed once. Yeah. Where I was so exhausted, I was having a rest in the afternoon, like five o'clock. Yeah and fell asleep and didn't wake up again yeah and my eldest put me to bed oh i love it and she she left a little <laughs> note yeah I, I woke up at like 9 30 and i was in awake <laughs> yeah, but yeah. she left a little note i got up at 9 30 like what the crap's happened here yeah, yeah. walk around the house is dark yes. everyone's in bed and she'd, she'd put everyone to bed oh. and she let dad sleep and oh. so you know without going it was them in a in a, in a situation which is harmful to them they yeah, just knew, no. she just knew at that stage yeah yeah everybody's safe dad's home yeah. we're just gonna let him snore yeah, yeah um we one of the things we love to do is to put language around some of this stuff and keep it really really simple so mm. that people can use this particularly in families and so one of the things we write um around that is identify your weakness at the wobbly point so the wobbly point's great language to put in with your kids and so the wobbly point is the point at which you are beginning to get physical signals that if you keep doing what you're doing, mm -hmm. it's all going to turn to custard. Mm. Um, and so learning to identify, you know, what, what's happening in your body. And it's often easier to see in others. So I'm sure you could, your girls would see it in you. Yeah, right. You know, where are your wobbly points? And it's not the point at which you've, you've blown a gasket or fallen asleep. It's the point at which you are just like, something yeah. needs to change way back here. I, I actually, speaking of that, not to interrupt you yeah. too much, I can think about that. Like, I mean, you know my girls. Yeah. Um, and I describe my house when they're there as, 
um, noisy, always singing, always dancing. Yeah. That's my house. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I feel the noise getting too much yeah. for me, yeah. like the, the, <laughs> the constant Ed Sheeran or the yeah. constant Cardi B or whatever <laughs> it is, when I just because I love I'm, I'm happy with my music. I mean I've written yeah, radio. Yeah, so yeah. I love oh, hey, so, yeah. And when I just kind of go, I can't handle this noise right now. Yeah, that's a wobbly point for me. Yeah, yeah. And even going, you know, this is a bit of a wobbly week, so therefore my tolerance to that noise is maybe going to be even lower. Yeah. Um, and understanding. So what we love about it is that with the wobbly point, you don't have to explain why, how, what happened. It's just all I have to say is. Guys, I'm a bit wobbly. And they can say it to one another. You know, when they're feeling a bit like yeah. something yesterday would have been fine to ask me to do that, but did, but today I'm a bit wobbly. And so when we express it to each other, you know, I'm a little bit wobbly, and then you go, okay, I call, now I know just to step in earlier or to help you earlier or to maybe ask a little less or maybe just not have this conversation mm. right now to the point where, um, you know, I, I really want to make a jelly emoji. I don't know how you make an emoji, but I thought it would be cool to just send a jelly I'm wobbly, you know. I don't, right, no, I no, guess. no questions asked. No, no issue. Just that's all you need to know. Because when you are emotionally wobbly, that's all you know. Yeah. You don't usually know why. I mean, you can yeah. maybe sit down and analyze it, whatever. But you, you don't really have the energy to do that. You just need to know. I'm a bit wobbly. I just want to let you know, and then we can take steps to do something about it. I think that's really good language for kids as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we all know kids through our own experiences or through you know friends experiences yeah. who who are who have mental wellness issues as yeah, well 100%. and i think that's a great word to be able to give yeah. to them yeah you know we've all seen that the, the kid have the meltdown who you think gosh they're a bit old for that sort of thing but m- maybe they, they they've they, gone past their wobbly point. yeah exactly yeah. yeah no i think that's a really interesting yeah. way to, to not just give language to but i think about giving that language specifically to the kids as yeah really, we really love it and because it's kind of fun you know it's like yeah. i'm a bit wobbly and it's cool and, and girls pick it up really well at right. school i mean I, I taught a bunch of girls and we talked about the wobbly point and and then they were like you know ushering somebody through and i was like you okay and they're like it's okay miss she's just a little bit wobbly <laughs> <laughs> and i love it you know so another one we use is um the volcano versus the geyser And so, you know, pushing down just, and I think parents do this, you know, it's fine, it's fine, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll take it, I'll absorb it, I'll absorb it, I'll crush it. And then at some stage in your life even, you know, in a big scale or is just, it blows, you know, and a a volcano just destroys everything in its path. Mm. And that's a very Kiwi thing. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah, explosion. I'm not fine. And so we love this idea. Again, I was going to say another thing you see in mothers quite a lot. (laughs) A lot, yeah. Yeah. And fathers, where they've just had enough or, you know, midlife, uh, you know, is this all it's all about? And it's like, so instead of doing the volcano, we do a geyser. So the geyser goes off once a day. Yeah. And when it goes off, we all stand around and go, oh, look at her go. Give her a little (laughs) pucky pucky. (laughs) And I love, you know, people pay to see that stuff. But I love this idea that sometimes it's 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 almost a bit embarrassing to let it out. Yeah. But it's actually really healthy. I'd rather live with a geyser because we can put a little fence around them mm. and they're quite cute, you know, and they look pretty in the backyard. And and they just, they're letting off some steam and it's done in a controlled manner. Um, so, cause, so we've got the wobbly point, the, the other one is make a big scene and carry on. And that's part of that, guys. It's okay to make your scene instead of keep calm and carry on. Make a big scene, you know, just let it out. Right time and place in mm. a nice way, in mm. a loving way. And then we carry on. And I think it's so tempting just to hold it in, hold it in, hold it in. And it just doesn't do us any favours in the long run. Because what it's saying is you have the right to infringe on me over and over and over again. And what we're not demonstrating to our kids, I mean, I'm using the kids as an example, but we're not demonstrating is that I have the right to express myself because I want them to have the right to express themselves. Yeah, right. You know, one day when they're in a a work environment or a relational environment, I want them to be able to stand up for themselves Mm -hmm. because... Damn, they might, you know, we want them to be strong, healthy adults as well. So, but putting that language in, we just find it really useful. Is this language your language? Are these ideas and concepts you guys yeah. have come up with? Yeah. So, when's the book coming out? Oh, I'm writing one. We're on a write three. Yeah, yeah. So, we're going to use um, the, the make a big scene and carry on, the wobbly point, and then the third one is one degree of change. Right. And yeah, we're going to do uh, some small sort of books, workbooks, and actually look at that stuff. and the the find uh, the the big thing that we love is that when people then adopt that language into their world I've made posters of them you know they're like the keep calm and carry on but they're with those things and um, it, by having them there having them on the fridge having them on the wall 
um, and just being able to refer back to them. Mm-hmm. It's just done in a fun, positive, practical way um, and in the hope that it it's sort of preemptive. Yeah. Yeah, getting to those things before they become, you know, massive. I think much like anything, if you can uh, deliver – uh, to an audience, uh, a new way of explaining a, a really difficult, tried and true uh, yeah, yeah. position, you know, <laughs> yeah. a thing that had gone on yeah. in a way that's easily explained and easily received. Yeah. I mean, also, you know, the guys are the wobbly point. It's all kind of cute language yeah. sort of yeah. thing. It's not like, you know, it's not like, Father, my, I'm feeling a little bit stressed at the moment and so <laughs> I just need to have my space. And yeah. and you're like, well, actually, we're doing dishes right now. And it's like, mm, well, Dad, I'm just a bit wobbly. All right, well, yeah. cool. you know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, and I think it's, I think it'd be particularly helpful for kids. Yeah. I'm not saying it's not for, for adults, yeah, but, no, but particularly for yeah. kids. And the thing is, if you reach your wobbly point, that's cool. You'll, you'll, you can come back and do the dishes. Yeah. Like once you've done a little bit of self-care. You might, you might need to go and take a break or, you know, whatever. You've still got to come back and fulfil your responsibilities. Yeah, yeah. But we've accepted the fact that, you know, you've expressed yourself. Because um, unfortunately I can't go to the bank and ASB and say, look, you know, I can't pay my mortgage this week. I'm just, I'm a, I'm a bit wobbly. A bit wobbly. <laughs> They'll be like, yeah, we're a bit wobbly too. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's those realities and practical. But we're hoping that um, just by demystifying, um, you know, I call myself a translator. I read the the medical journals mm-hmm. and turn them into stories and pictures and, and fun examples so that the people who can't be bothered don't have the time or wouldn't have the capacity to read the medical journal mm-hmm. can actually gain that information. Um, and it, yeah, it's backed by a lot of research, but um, it's, it's putting it into everyone's hands. So yeah. once you have the book, books yes. yep. done <laughs> you'll have resources and merchandise and that kind of stuff to sell yeah. do you have that sort of thing at the moment we when do. you go so you yeah, do when yeah. people turn up well we've got albums but so something that we've just worked on is a small group resource that came up on the website there and so we've done an eight week small group um series so yeah. it's got there's eight videos and each one of those has that same kind of thing so there's one um one called the Brain Zoo, and it talks about um, the lizard, the monkey, and the, the lizard, the mouse, and the monkey brain, and different parts of your brain. And when you're under a lot of stress, how you're in that real um, fight or flight mode, and that's yeah. like the lizard. You know, how do you address with? How do you address that? And how do you deal with that? Um, there's ones on stress triggers. There's stuff there. Oh, you're just blessed, stressed, and depressed. Um, there's all these different kind of. Um, Things one to do with being the middle penguin, what it's like to deal with loneliness, mm-hmm. um, living in the tension. What's that example? Middle penguin. The middle penguin. Oh, okay. So the idea that the penguins huddle round and they take turns to be the penguin in the middle. Yeah. And so how often when we're going through stress and we're going through big issues, we find ourselves having maybe been a stronger penguin who's used to being on the outside helping everybody else. Right. And we find ourselves maybe a bit damaged, a bit broken, a little bit you know, saw. And so we have to end up in our community or our family or our whanau in the middle and with our broken wing sort of holding up our flipper. Mm-hmm. And it's embarrassing. Mm. Oh, for me, I found it really, you know, it's, it's humbling Embarrass- to say something's Embarrassing wrong. to require help. Yes. Be, to be the, the target um, of the help rather than yeah, the one doing the help. It's hard work because you're like, well, I'm used to being the one that's always had, you know, really good advice and, mm. and, and maybe I've had the privilege of being able to be that outside penguin. So coming into the middle and actually going, what do I do when I am that that person, that guy, you know, and how do I handle being that guy that's for interesting. a while? So we find it difficult to be the, the subject of the help mm. rather than the helper. Mm. That feels a bit Kiwi as well. Yeah, maybe, absolutely. Maybe that's just human though. Yeah, I think it is a bit Kiwi though because we tend to want to pretend she'll that we can stay be on the outside. Yeah, no, I'm, but, I'm you know, right. we've lost a couple of flippers, but we're still on the outside. Mm. <laughs> you know, we want to be on and I'm fine. And then actually going, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not fine. That's what it I is. Need eh? you it's, help the, me out. it's the it's the it's the I'm not. I wonder if it's more. I wonder if it's more difficult to ask for help than it is to receive help. If yeah. person A who needs the help just had someone turn up on their doorstep and help them, yep. that's probably easier than person A who needs the help asking person B, can yeah. you please help me? Well, one of the things that we find the hardest is that the big mental health message has been, if you need help, ask for it. Mm. I can't. 
yeah. when I need help, I'm not going to ask for help. I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm not. I'm like, I'm learning to, but I'm, I'm at my probably least likely to yeah. when I have retreated, when I have gone a bit beige on the inside, when depression is big in my world, or when anxiety is really high and I'm starting to panic about what you might think of me if I need help. Mm. And so that's why another reason for the wobbly point is we talk about identifying it in others. Because I think what's really important is that we we study one another so that we know when we're different, you know, and actually going, you not, mm, something's wrong. Or I know the circumstances around you, it's highly likely mm. that that's going to be impacting you. You may not have felt it yet, but I just want to kind of come in alongside you. That also um, just echoes the importance of community. Yeah, absolutely. With uh, whatever that community is and, yeah. and the isolation. And I think for me personally, mm. one of my biggest issues when I – we went through a marriage breakup. It was a year after moving to a new city where yeah. I knew no one. <laughs> yeah, that was a perfect storm. I was thinking of you as we storm. drove down the hill today, just thinking about the fact that you had, you know, you'd, you'd come here with one set of circumstances, yeah. or one expectation. And within about 18 months. It's all changed. And and so suddenly the rugs pulled out from under your feet in that sense of you had that happen to you back home. Mm. That community would have been you know, still there would have been different factors around. I don't know, it might have been better, it might have been worse, Well, I, I think, I'm aware of it. Yeah, I'm thinking about the better and worse. Some things probably would have been better, some things probably would have been worse. I yeah. mean, I imagine trying to go to living in a house by oneself in Auckland <laughs> would have been far more difficult than living in a house by yes. oneself in Dunedin. Yeah. So I think financially it would have been a lot harder to be back in Auckland. Yeah. But, but support-wise, yeah, yeah. it would have been a lot easier to be back in Auckland than be here when, the, when all that happened kind yeah. of four or five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's yeah. one of those, and there's another one living in the tension, and it's balancing out the life you've got with the life you thought you were going to have. Yeah, you know, living and living, dealing with disappointments. Um, there's one on on forgiveness, and it's not done from a like, haha, you just have to forgive everyone. It's like how hard it is, like incredibly difficult. But what's the science behind it? Mm. So each of those series has a, a video, and then there's a workbook that goes with it. And small groups have started to do that, where they've been able to create a smaller. Uh, whānau for themselves, you know, people they trust might be their friends, might be just some mates or might be a, a community group and then they start to run through that themselves and so they can take the conversation along and then down and then up and along and down and they can delve in because people say, oh we want to talk about our mental health but what do you say? Mm. You know, we go around, is everyone fine? Yep. <laughs> you know, and what you genuinely do in a group, everyone says they're fine except that one guy who wants to tell all about everything and we all wish he wouldn't come every week because he's, he's, you know, um, and then no one else will say anything. So then, it's actually, then, it's, it's... In some way he's a bit of a lesson to the rest. You should <laughs> guys speak up or you're not going to get a chance. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it's <laughs> scaffolding um, language. It's scaffolding uh discussion around it and we're getting real cool feedback from that as well do you so want to go and do any kind of training do you want to go and get a, a psychology degree or something like that i've thought about it and actually i've thought about it at length um so what i have started doing is so i've got my teachers you know some are teaching qualifications um but what i have been doing is training in, in smaller sectors so mm. i've done some papers um, some online papers but been pretty amazing on um done one on the science of happiness through Yale, um, just about to complete that. I've done um, introduction to psychology and I'm also one on neuroscience and then one on practical positive mental health treatments right. in the, the University of Sydney. And I've looked at putting aside three years to train and I don't feel like it's what I want to do right now. I'm open to the idea and yep. I'm open to the criticism that I don't have that qualification. And so for that, I am upskilling <laughs> in a more practical and a more sort of um, tangible way. But what I do is when I go through all that stuff, I've got part of me learning and the other part of me saying, how, what am I learning from this that I can pass on? Because if I just spend three years learning, then that's three years where people aren't going to be getting the interpretation or the, the translation. Yeah. So I'm pulling out of that stuff going, right, what's my next series of um, one-minute videos? What's my next takeaway that I can give to the – what's my next wobbly point idea, you know, that I can give to people? But there's that um, – you know, people can always deny your – academic sort of intellectual perspective mm. but they can never deny sort of personal experience that's right so you know if you're talking about your experience what you've seen what you've learned how mm. you address it yeah no one can really criticize you for that that's but, right and, and i, I am I, intellectual and, and i and i wonder if some <laughs> i wonder if um you know some 
no disrespect to them, yeah. but trained academics who have been through university who have the masters and the PhD, then they but they then they don't have the personal experience. Yeah. So this is coming from a completely e- different yeah. place. Yeah, and it is. I think it's a unique point of view. And yeah, so I've looked and I mean, a lot of this stuff is incredibly tedious and boring, and that's my job is to filter through that and to turn it into something that's actually palatable. Because if it doesn't make a difference, it doesn't change the everyday life. It's just theory. So you're. Um I'm thinking about you talking about this is what you'd like to do as full time gig yeah. sort of thing, yeah. uh, using your music terminology <laughs> oh, okay. gigs. Um, yeah. You spend all this time reading and researching and doing yeah. other things anyway. Yeah. So it'd be good to figure out a way to get paid for doing that. <laughs> yeah, nobody pays for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I have. I've I've spent hours um, upskilling of of those things. You know, and actually doing that. But I feel a responsibility to do that. You know, what what is the what's the the current theory on this stuff? I do a lot of that stuff, but um, and I enjoy it. Um, I think uh, we're, we're we're coming towards probably a wrap up time. But I was thinking you were just talking there about making one minute videos. Yeah, I reckon we should make a live stream one minute video right now. Okay, I'd like to know from you. You ready? <laughs> You're getting set? <laughs> yeah, I'm just getting my good angle. I don't know. Just uh, something to share with people. Imagine that someone's tuning in and they've got Christmas coming up and they're yeah. getting a bit stressed about it. Give us something. Share something with us. Mm. I thought you were going to reach for the bottle first. <laughs> yeah, that was the first point. To make yeah. sure. <laughs> so start with a drink. Yeah. Um, you know, stress the general stresses of Christmas, especially yeah. when it comes to mental wellness. Yeah. Give something to us, uh, to the people watching and listening, where they can go, Oh, like a little tidbit, a little help, mm. a little something they can think about to help them get through a stressful time of year for many, yeah. which is Christmas. Yeah. And I would say give yourself a gift first. So preemptive is always better than, you know, ambulance at the bottom of the hill. And giving yourself a gift doesn't have to be financial. But actually at the beginning of each week, maybe go, I'm going to give myself the gift of some time, maybe some social, you know, a hangout with a person. So maybe over the December month, once a week, Give yourself a little, a little gift, and so actually going. I'm going to maybe see a friend. I'm going to maybe go for a walk, get out and do some exercise. Um, maybe I'm going to just literally block out the world, do nothing, see nothing, see nobody, go see a movie by myself, do something on my own, or I'm going to do something to help someone else that's not going to be too taxing on myself. But I think if we actually do put ourselves first for a bit which we don't tend to do, then the other stuff is not so arduous because we've at least prioritised ourselves at the beginning. I think as well what I'm hearing you say is if you make, like anyone can watch a movie on a mm. Monday night sitting at home you know, on Netflix, but if you make an intentional decision that I'm, this is my time, yeah. so you're deciding that this hour and a half is your time this out, my, yeah. rather than just watching a movie because it yeah. happens to be on, yeah. that, and I'm thinking as you were talking about, about how well that would fill up that reserve tank that we talked about yeah. before yeah. if one needed it to be filled yeah. up and to get prepped for yeah. Christmas. We um, get, get a bow and stick it on your TV. Get a bow. Get a little bow, like a little, um, you know, those sticky bows. Stick yep. it on the TV. That's my gift to myself. An hour and a half. Phone is off. Everyone's out. Popcorn is full. This is my <laughs> time. And if you're going to do nothing, do it intentionally. So doing nothing for yeah. no reason. You've got this little voice and you're going, I should be doing this. I should be doing that. If you're going to do nothing and do nothing, then do nothing. Go, think, I'm going to do nothing I think and I'm going to enjoy thing. it. Like I, I'm, I'm doing this nothing for a reason. I'm yeah. not just wasting time. No, no. This no. is my time, and I'll do whatever I like. And that might just be your, your internally your head spinning at ten degrees to yeah. making it making it a decision rather yeah. than just a, an outcome. But that could make a huge difference. Could be a nap, oh, but yeah. it's a nap where you don't go. Oh, I'm just going to stay awake because oh, I shouldn't go to sleep, but I will. Actually, going, I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to enjoy this. So make the most of it. If people want to find out more about you, what you do, what you're up to, yeah. uh, ask you to come places to talk love to maybe yeah. even figuring out you're talking about this new trust and the supporting of the work you're doing what can yeah. they do so website juliagrace.co.nz or facebook um, julia grace nz through the messages through that everything is me it's not going filtering through someone else it's just me <laughs> um but yeah messaging us um and actually making a point of contact and then we can start a conversation that'd be really cool lovely to see you yeah you too we'll you're catch doing- you next time yay